about your water. Day, we will already be quiet, and I don't have to say welcome real loud. Well, good morning. Thank you. It is so, thank you, Jacob. It's so good to be here with you this morning and to have the opportunity to worship the Lord together. And so thank you for carving this time out to give to the Lord today. Before we get started with our service, I have a couple of announcements. The first one is about our church wide social that will be happening on November the 20th. And if you would, just to help us prepare for the main dish, there is a sign-up sheet at the connection table right outside those double doors. And so if you would, just sign up. Let us know um, if you're bringing anything, so, but mainly for us to be able to prepare the chicken. My second announcement is for that night. We're going to do a night of prayer. And so we would enjoy... Um, we want to enjoy one another's company, but ultimately have the opportunity to pray together, to read God's word, to sing, and it's just going to be a good time for us to um, just focus our hearts as a church together around prayer. And so if you would, um, plan to come back that night at 6 p.m. Um, the youth will be in here. We will have child care for um, kindergarten down. But we want our first through fifth grade in here with us so they can have the opportunity to witness that and even participate. So um, please bring your children as well. And then lastly, if you're a guest, we want to especially welcome you. Today there is a connection card in the seat pocket in front of you. If you would, take that card, fill it out, um, come either give it to me or to Kyle or put it in the offering boxes in the back. We would love to know that you've joined us and for us to be able to follow up with you this week. With that being said, let us stand and start in worship. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
As part of our prayer time, uh, as we do every year, I want to uh, recognize uh, those that are part of our body here at Westside that uh, have served and are currently serving uh, in our armed forces. I am proud of of so many uh, in our church who have uh, served in, in one of the branches of our military, and I'm thankful for that uh, legacy and heritage uh, that our church has from so many who have served. And uh, I also want this to be a time that we uh, remember and pray for those that are currently serving. Uh, over the last few decades, there have been uh, more deaths from suicide than there have been uh, from action. And so uh, as, as we remember our veterans, we need to continue to pray for them, be a uh, support system for them uh, as they come back from, uh, from serving one of our branches of military. And so uh, this morning, I want to take an opportunity uh, to, to recognize those uh, that are with us this morning who have served. And I'll go through uh, each branch of the military. And if you'll stand, uh, if it's uh, the branch that you have served in, uh, we would like to recognize you. And especially if there's someone who has served in the Space Force, our newest branch of the military that's only been established for a few years, I really want to know. Uh, if, if you're in the Space Force, I need to meet you. But uh, for those that are with us, we have men and women in, in, in some of these categories. If you uh, served in the Army, will you please stand? All right. All right. For those that were in the Marine Corps, will you please stand? I know there are some that were in the Navy, if you will stand. And if you were in the Air Force, will you please stand? Is anyone in the Coast Guard? All right. And I've got to ask, is anyone or was anyone in its brief tenure in the Space Force? I didn't think so. <laughs> All right. 
For all of you that, that did serve, uh, I want you to stand a moment as we pray, but I also want to ask uh, for those of you that have a child or a grandchild that is currently serving, I would like you to stand uh, with those who have served as we pray together because we want to make sure as we pray that we remember those that are currently serving uh, right now that are represented by our families uh, right here at Westside this morning. And so uh, for those families that have a, a child or grandchild uh, currently serving, if you will stand with those that uh, have served, that are with us this morning for our time of prayer. Y'all can all stand now. Let's pray together. Father, we're here to honor you. And as we honor you, we thank you for uh, these men and women who have served our country. Father, who have uh, sacrificed so much so that we can sit here in a nice warm place and worship you freely. And so, Father, we thank you for their dedication, uh, their dedication to our church, their dedication to you, their dedication to uh, their families, their dedication to our country. Father, we pray that you continue to uh, just, just shower your grace and your mercy on them as we know that so many uh, struggle after seeing uh, war. And so, Father, we pray for your comfort and peace in their lives even this morning. Father, for uh, those families represented here this morning that have loved ones right now serving uh, some even overseas, Father, we pray your protection over them. Father, we pray for uh, these families that are uh, here, uh, so many of them separated from their loved ones now. We pray your presence uh, just be so evident in their lives right now. And Father, we continue to pray uh, for those serving in the military all over the world. Father, we pray for uh, their protection. We pray for their safety. Father, we thank you uh, for our country. We thank you for uh, so many who have uh, taken that step to uh, defend our country, to defend the freedoms, the liberties that we are able to enjoy even right now. Father, as we have this service, uh, as we have this time of worship, not worried, Father, again, we thank you first and foremost for the freedoms that you bestowed on us as, as your creation. And so, Father, we thank you for a country and, and, and those even in this room who have fought to, uh, to keep those freedoms that come from you. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please stand and continue to worship with us, please. So we pour out our praise. 
seated second grade and under go to your worship time
One of my girls asked me yesterday, what are you preaching about tomorrow, Dad? She said, not the Sermon on the Mount again, are you? (laughs) They're different sermons. Yes, we are continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And this morning, we're going to be talking about probably uh, one of the most popular statements Jesus ever made. Uh, at least the one that's thrown around probably the most often uh, in today's culture. Judge not lest you be judged. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced if you were to just poll people, you know, kind of one of those street interviews, and you were to ask people uh, what are two verses from the Bible, uh, you would get John 3.16, and you would get Judge not lest you be judged. That people are very familiar uh, with these words. And I, I think they've be- it, it's become so popular because it seems to uh, support two cultural beliefs. Uh, it seems to support the, the idea that, that religion is private, that can't judge me for what I believe. I won't judge you for what I believe. We're all, you know, headed in the right direction. Don't judge whether you think I'm right or wrong in my religious beliefs. And it also uh, supports, seems to support, the belief that morality is relative, which means you can't tell anyone what they believe is wrong. In fact, I, I've, I've heard lost people use this line, who are you to tell me I'm wrong? Doesn't the Bible say not to judge? Uh, they, they use this verse to uh, defend uh, and they throw around this phrase to silence other people's opinions. 
And it's also used to, to justify sinful behavior. That I, I can do what I want and, and don't judge me and to justify uh, the sin that is in their life. And so I, I'm convinced most people use this phrase without knowing the, the context or the meaning that Jesus intended when he included this as part of his Sermon on the Mount. It, it, it reminds me of a line from a movie that maybe some of you have watched called Princess Bride. But in Princess Bride, there's this character named Inigo Montoya. And, and he uses, I won't try and do his accent because I'll butcher it. But he says, you keep using this word. I do not think it means what you think it means, is what he says in that movie. And I think that's how a lot of people use this phrase. Don't judge. The Bible says not to judge. And we throw that out there. Uh, I'm not saying you necessarily, but people uh, throw that out there. Uh, and and I, I would argue this is one of the most misinterpreted uh, phrases from the mouth of Jesus in, in the Bible. And so uh, let's spend some time this morning looking at uh, these verses and, and see what, what Jesus uh, has for us this morning. So Matthew chapter 7. We've gone through chapter 5. We've gone through chapter 6. Now we're in Matthew chapter 7, wrapping up in the next few weeks the Sermon on the Mount. But Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, will be measured to you. And so before we talk about, I think, what's at the heart of, of these verses, I, I want to briefly uh, mention a few things that Jesus did not mean with these first two verses of chapter 7. Because when we look at all of Scripture, obviously Jesus did not expect us as believers to stop holding each other accountable. Sometimes I think Christians think, well, God doesn't want to hold each other accountable. We're not supposed to judge one another. I can't judge about your life and, and help hold you accountable. We know from the whole of God's Word that accountability is, is a strong function of us as a body of believers. It's a responsibility that we have as Christians to hold one another accountable. And Jesus in these verses is not banning us from making judgments about what is right and what is wrong. And he's not banning us from letting others know when they are wrong. That's what a significant portion of, of Jesus' ministry was about, correcting false beliefs. That is a, a, a role of us as well, to correct false beliefs. The Bible is full of passages that call us to discern what is good from what is wrong, what is good from what is evil, what is good fruit and what is bad fruit. And so this passage about not judging can't mean that we are not allowed to make moral judgments. That is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not banning us from calling sin, sin. In fact, this Sermon on the Mount, he's calling out false beliefs, even in this sermon. But I... I I can say that this passage is definitely a call for all of us to abstain from hypocrisy in judging others. Because that is what we're prone to. And that's what the Pharisees, as they hear this sermon, were prone to do as well. They were holding others accountable and judging them by standards that they weren't living to themselves. There was hypocrisy in their judgment. And I believe Jesus here is distinguishing acts of judgment from an attitude and a, and a spirit of judgmentalism. And I think that is if we're, we're, we're not careful, we can, we can kind of inch over into a, a spirit of, of judgmentalism, a spirit of uh, criticism. And I think that, this, that being judgmental or, or having a critical spirit uh, is prevalent. And it's a contagious 
disease. A, a critical spirit, you, you've seen it in your family. You've seen it among a group of friends. That critical spirit can be contagious. As, as you're sitting around eating a meal with a group of friends and, and one just has that critical spirit, it can easily spread to the others at the table. And it really reveals a heart issue. There was a book uh, entitled Men Sent from God, and the author Richard DeHaan, he listed uh, some of the criticisms that pastors receive. And, and I'm thankful that I am not uh, the pastor of critical folks uh, here at Westside. I was talking with a friend on Friday at a, a, a Veterans Day program, and they asked me, how's, how's church going? And I said, it's going great. And they said, is it hard dealing with critical people all the time? And I said, that's not my experience. I mean, I hear from other pastors that that's the norm, that that is what they experience. But I'm thankful that's not what I experience here. But this, this book is, uh, and I, this one paragraph I'm going to read, uh, this is the reality of, of many pastors. It reveals the critical spirit that many Christians, church-going Christians, uh, have. This is what... Uh, Richard said, if the pastor's young, they say he lacks experience. If his hair is gray, huh. <laughs> what if you're gray and 40? That's kind of both. I don't know what I am. If middle-aged, if his hair is gray, he's too old for the young people. If he has five or six children, he's irresponsible. If he has no children, he's setting a bad example. If he uses a lot of illustrations, he neglects the Bible. If he does not use enough, his preaching isn't relevant. If he condemns wrong deeds, he's cranky. If he does not, he's compromising. If he drives an old car, he shames his congregation. If he drives a new car, he's setting his affection on earthly things. And I realize this is tongue in cheek. I mean, this, this, you know, he's writing, I guess, to be funny. But it, shed light, it sheds light on the fact that many followers of Christ make a, a habit of being critical. A, a habit of condemnation where they think a, a critical spirit is one of the spiritual gifts. A, a, a friend of mine's young daughter was in her Sunday school class. Uh, they live in Charlotte, so it's, it's no one in here. But a few years back, the teacher of the Sunday school class uh, was trying to do a get-to-know-you game with the kids. And so the teacher asked each kid, what's your hobby or what sport do you like to play? What is it you like to do with your free time? And so, you know, the answers were baseball or soccer or horseback riding. Well, my friend's daughter, who is a bit of a pill, she's much older now and still a pill. She said, some people play sports. Some people read books. I judge. That was her answer for her hobby. And, and so... As we read these verses about what Jesus says about judging, we, he's not talking about evaluating behavior, but rather condemning people, looking down on other people. It's very similar, and we find a good parallel in, in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, where Paul says, Why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. What Jesus is forbidding in the verses is that critical, judgmental spirit that can creep in our lives if we're not careful. J.C. Ryle said this about these verses. What our Lord means to condemn is a fault-finding spirit, a readiness to blame others for trifling offenses or matters of indifference, a habit of passing rash and hasty judgments, a disposition to magnify the errors and infirmities of our neighbors and make worse of them. This is what our Lord forbids. And then he adds at the end, I was, it was common among the Pharisees. And I think there are a few important things to remember, just even in these first two verses, and then we're going to get to the illustration that Jesus uses about these verses. But in these first few verses, I think there, there, there are some things that will help protect us from being judgmental, even in these two verses. 
And first, it's important to remember that we are not the judge. We're not the judge. Look at verse 1 again. It says, do not judge or you too will be judged. You will be judged. Guess what? If, if you are going to be judged yourself, that means that you are not the judge. In the same way, if you are in a courtroom and you're not the one behind the bench in a robe with a gavel, then you are not the judge. It's your life that is being evaluated. We're not the judge. God is the judge. Uh, unfortunately, some people think they are the, the, the judge, the jury, and the executioner by having a harsh and a critical spirit. They're always looking for other people's faults by playing the role of the judge. But there's a reason God's the judge and we are not the judge. We aren't qualified to be the judge. We don't know person's history. We don't know their background. We don't know extenuating circumstances. We don't know a person's motives. We can only see actions. We can't see their heart. We're not the judge. And the second reason that Jesus gives for not trying to be the judge is that God's going to judge us in the same way that we judge others. If we are harsh and unloving and unforgiving, why in the world would we expect God to be kind and loving and forgiving to us? Paul says a very similar thing in Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. In other words, Jesus is saying that you should expect to receive judgment on the same basis that you give it. Or the standard with which you, you criticize others will be applied to you as well. And so, in the remaining minutes, I want us to look at the illustration that Jesus gives to explain uh, his teaching, to see how hypocrisy can creep in as Christians. So let's pick up in verse 3. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This illustration that, that Jesus gives, it's, it's humorous. I, I think he's, there, there's humor here in that he's overstating something so drastically that I'm, I'm sure it's the crowd that, that heard this probably laughed. I mean, he's talking about, you're worried about the speck in somebody's eye when you have this huge log coming out of your own eye. But there's a lot of wisdom in this. And we see the emphasis just in these few verses. There, there's a couple little words that appear three times in these verses. Your own. Your own. Your own. It appears three times. We are very good. We are naturally good at judging others. But not so good at judging others ourselves. Three times Jesus says, you're worried about this speck. What about your own eye? What about your own eye? What about your own eye? We are naturally good at seeing specks in other people's eyes. It's been said that we are good judges for the mistakes of others, but we are good defense lawyers for our own mistakes. And so if, if you're quick to find fault in others, Jesus Ask you here, are you just as quick to find fault in yourself? And so Jesus describes someone who, who sees a, 
a speck. It's the idea of a little piece of sawdust in someone else's eye, but then they don't notice the, the log. Some of your translations use the word pole to describe uh, a plank, maybe, in some of your translations to describe this huge piece of wood. And, and the word here is, this is a big piece of wood. I mean, a two by four would be, you know, an over-the-top comparison here, but this isn't even a, a two by four. This is, this is like uh, a, a mast on a ship. This is something that's like a, a telephone pole, a, a power pole, a huge piece of wood that's 40 feet long is the word that's used here for the log or the plank, depending on your translation. This is, this is like a, 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 the main beam and the structure of a home. This is, this is the battering ram that is used in Jesus telling this story. And so this, this plank is, Jesus is using it to over-exaggerate, almost to be humorous, but Jesus is saying, you've got this huge beam. You've got this power pole coming out of your eye and you're looking at the speck in your brother's eye. This is overstated to say, are you serious? Is this really what you're doing? And, and the reason Jesus pictures the sins as a plank is because uh, we, we naturally see the speck. We naturally see the sins and, and we begin to think that we are better than they are. And whatever sin you may see in someone else, you, we know our sin a whole lot better. And so he uses this plank to describe our sin when we're concerned about the speck. We, we tend to magnify the sins of others. And we always tend to minimize our own sin. And that's why Jesus is so extreme in calling our sin planks. Because naturally, we minimize our sin. We obsess over the faults of others, but overlook conveniently our own faults. And when you ignore your own sin, and you concentrate on the sin of others, then we develop that, that harsh, critical Spirit, that judgmental spirit that Jesus is forbidding in this passage. But when you're truly conscious of your own sins before God, then you'll grow to be more generous and loving toward others in dealing with their sin. Danny Aiken, who was the president of the seminary that uh, Chris and I went to, um, will say that... Uh, He's soft with his words. <laughs> Not really. Uh, this is what he said in his commentary on this passage. Those who take on the assignment of spiritual peeping Tom, spiritual garbage inspector, or spiritual Gestapo are deaf, dumb, and blind to the enormity and magnitude of their own sin. How hypocritical for us to care about others' sin more than we care about our own sin. We're getting there in a minute, but I want to go ahead and throw this out there before you think I'm saying, Jesus is not saying we shouldn't be concerned about other people's sin. We should. It's what accountability is. Other people's sin should grieve us, but we should care about our own sin. We're naturally good about caring about other people's sin and not our own. That's the hypocrisy that Jesus is teaching against. But we should also be concerned about other people's sin, but not more than we're concerned about our own sin. When Jesus tells us not to judge, he's not prohibiting us from confronting other people in their sin or calling sin, sin. But as Jesus explains, you have to address your sin, the log in your own eye before you can help others with their sin. It's impossible 
to see and to help with the sawdust in someone else's eye when you have this huge plank in your own eye. You have to care about your own eye first, and then when you deal with your own sin, you're able to help others in their sin. It's like the directions the flight attendant gives you at the beginning of a flight. They tell you in case of emergency to take care of securing your own oxygen before you help those around you get their oxygen. Now this doesn't mean that we don't need to this doesn't mean that we have to be perfect before we can help others in their sin. If that were the case then none of us would ever be able to to help others with their sin. But it does mean that you need to confront and confess and acknowledge your own sin to God before you're in a position to where you can help others with their sin. Because look at, look at verse 5 again, especially the second half of the verse. First, take the log out of your own eye. When you take the log out of your own eye, when you acknowledge and confess and deal with your own sin in your life, then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. When he says don't judge, he's not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about the specks in our brother and sister's eyes. We should be. That speck needs to be removed. You know how terrible it is. If any of you have ever worked with wood and there's sawdust everywhere, you know just one little piece of sawdust or one little piece of dirt in your eye can really irritate. It is even a piece of sawdust. Any sin in your life is something that needs to be dealt with. We're not to ignore the sawdust in other people's eyes, but we are called first to deal with the plank in our own eyes. It's not loving to ignore another person's faults. It's not loving to, to dismiss another person's sin. A.W. Pink puts it this way, if you really have my brother's welfare at heart, then love itself requires that I won't wink at his sins, but rather endeavor to save him from them. Just as much as it would demand me warning him when I perceive the first wisp of smoke issuing from one of his windows, why wait till the house be fully burned down before I give him the alarm? We have a responsibility to help with the specks in each other's eyes. But it's hypocritical if we don't deal with the planks in our own eyes First, if we truly love our brothers, if we truly love our sisters in Christ, then we want to help them with their sin. But Jesus says that we approach them as a brother or sister, not as a judge. One author said, be a helper of the other's faith instead of a critic of his faults. Whereas Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my favorites, wrote this, judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. Spurgeon said this, after we ourselves sanctified, we are bound to be eyes to the blind and correctors of unholy living, but not until then. We are called to hold each other accountable. We are called to help others in their sin, but we have to deal with our own first. And we don't approach them as a judge. That's God's title. That's God's role. We approach them as a brother and a sister in Christ that, that loves that person, that wants to help that person remove that sin, remove that speck from their life. But I almost skipped this verse. I'm not going to spend much time on it. But there is a group of people that won't accept this help. There, there are people in pride that will scoff at any help 
in their lives. They're described in verse 6. Don't give dogs what's holy. And don't throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. There are people in our lives that won't accept and even refuse help. That's okay. That's between them and God. As loving brothers and sisters, we should be concerned. We should do all that we can. But but some, they will just trample your efforts. But God's people in, in judging, we're not called to refrain from any judgments about what's right or wrong. We're not, we're not to not have anything to do with other people's lives because who am I to judge them and the sin in their life? It, it's your job to be involved, to do something about the speck in their eye. But we can't be hypocrites by ignoring the sin in our own lives. We should be known for how we love one another and not how we judge one another. It's unfortunate the reputation that the church at large has uh, had over the last decades, centuries, as a critical, judgmental people. Do we stand on right and wrong? Do we hide from the truth? Absolutely not. But in all that we do, we do it with gentleness. We do it with love. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Brothers, if someone's caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore, should help remove the speck from their eye, but do it gently, Paul says. We are to remove the speck from one another's eye, but we're to do it carefully, to do it gently, to do it in love. Because after all, John 13, 35 says, How will you know that you're my disciples? By your love for one another. That should be at the heart of us removing sawdust. It's a heart of love. It's a concern for our brothers and sisters. And so in these last couple minutes, you're going to see this next line and say, What? It's almost time. I'm just going to read to you. <laughs> <laughs> ten things. Don't for, it's just ten. I'm just, I'm not, they're not points of a sermon. I promise. I want to make this as practical as possible. Uh, and so I want to provide ten guidelines from Scripture that can prove helpful as we, we seek. We're called to make judgments without being judgmental. And uh, Danny Aiken, in, in, in a sermon he preached on this passage, he gave at the end these 10 guidelines. And so these are from uh, Danny Aiken. First, he says, again, this is how to make judgments without being judgmental. I hope these are practical. One, check your motives. Why am I doing this? Have I checked my my own heart uh, to know my motives, my my intentions? Because if we're not careful, it can be a wrong motive that we try and remove specks from people around us. Number two, examine your own walk with the Lord first. Are, Are you doing work about the sin in your life? Have you confessed that sin? Number three, seek out wisdom from God's word and godly counsel before acting. Sometimes we we need that godly counsel. Sometimes we need to search God's word before we help another with a speck in their eye. Number four, uh, that goes with anything that we do. Practice the golden rule. Think about how you would want to be treated if it were you receiving that correction uh, before you act. Number five, be careful not to make a a snap 
decision, a, a quick judgment in your correction. But, but take time to listen first. Sometimes we make quick judgments without knowing uh, really what's going on. And that can come across as very critical. Number six, pray for the one in sin before correcting. Don't just go on the attack without praying for that individual first because ultimately all sin is sin against God. And so pray for that individual. Number seven, don't forget the example of Jesus, how he helped, how he ministered, how even in his correction, it was done in love. He didn't condemn, he didn't ridicule. I think that's why so many Christians get this this kind of, reputation as being so judgmental. It's done in almost a way of ridicule when it should be done out of love and concern as as Jesus, when he loved tax collectors, he loved sinners. Number eight, speak the truth. This is not a call to not speak the truth. This is not what Jesus intended. It's not what I intend by this sermon, but speak the truth. Speak it, but do it in Love. When those two are not combined together, that's where it gets off track with being judgmental in our judging. Number nine, keep in mind that some things are right and wrong. Some things are truth and, and lies, but some things are just preference. And sometimes we can get distracted by things that are preference and make judgment calls on them when they're not necessarily things that are morally right or wrong or things that are right and wrong according to God's word. They're just preferences. So some things we need to acknowledge, all right, preferences are preferences. And maybe I differ with that person on this one. And 10, never forget that ultimately everyone, including you, gives an account to God who is our judge. We can't forget that as we're looking for specks, we've got a plank and we're going to be held accountable. We're going to be judged by God for that. And so we check our own hearts. We check our own lives first. I hope this is practical and I hope you don't hear what I'm not saying. <laughs> and I hope you don't not hear what I am saying. Uh, because this is a, a passage and a, especially a phrase that has been misconstrued in our society. Where, where, where people have tried to remove us from being able to make any judgment call as what's right and what's wrong. Because, nope, God says, don't judge. We can't say what's right or wrong for another person. There is truth. We stand on that truth. But when we stand on that truth, we must do it with love or we are the hypocrite that Jesus is talking about. And we have to first and foremost be concerned about the sin in our own lives that separates us from God. Or we're the hypocrite walking around with a 40-foot power pole uh, coming out of our good look. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and this practical teaching from Jesus. A practical teaching that's been misinterpreted so often. But Father, may we as this body of believers, may love motivate us to be concerned about one another, to be bothered by specks of sin in other people's eyes, but Father, not before we deal with our own sin. Father, through your Holy Spirit, convict us of sin in our own lives that needs to be dealt with, maybe even right now. And Father, I thank you for the accountability that we have with one another. Father, to help one another grow, to help one another better reflect Jesus Christ. But Father, with everything that we do, may the motivation be love. May it be with a heart of humility and concern. Father, we thank you for this teaching. We pray that we will leave here and apply it to our lives. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. 
Amen. We're going to sing one final song together this morning. Use this time to speak with God. Let's stand together and sing. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious. To you, the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. That's our benediction uh, that we sang together. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up for the meal next Sunday, to do so as you leave this morning. You're dismissed.